Okay, hello everybody. Uh, so today is the second to last uh, Physics 121 YouTube video. And in fact, uh, in this video, what we'll do is we'll reach the end of the examinable material for this course. Um, and I'll clearly indicate where that end happens. Um, and so there's really only one more topic that I want to discuss uh, for material that will be included uh, as part of the exam. So that topic is induced electric fields. And so let's just review what we know uh, from the recent videos. Uh, what we've been talking about is Faraday's law. And what Faraday's law does is it allows us to calculate an induced current in a loop of wire through which the magnetic flux changes. So we have a changing magnetic flux through the loop of wire and that changing magnetic flux results in an induced current. And remember, we can change flux in many ways. We can have the strength of a uh, magnetic field changing. We could have um, the area of the loop changing, or we could have the orientation of that loop relative to the magnetic field changing. And so let's imagine that we had a magnetic field that was going into the screen and then we have a loop of wire that's placed in that magnetic field. And uh, then let's suppose that the magnetic field strength B is increasing. Okay, well, if the magnetic field strength is increasing, let's let's do it this way. Let's here, let's put over here. These are the magnetic field lines going into the screen. And then let's suppose the magnetic field strength, the magnitude of the field is increasing. Then we can calculate by Faraday's law an induced EMF. And we did that calculation by just determining how the magnetic flux changes with time. And then if we knew the resistance of our loop of wire, then we could calculate the induced current as the induced EMF divided by the loop resistance. So R is the loop resistance. Okay, so in this case, um, well, okay, and then we could also say that the direction of I induced is determined by Lenz's law. So if we imagine the magnetic field strength is increasing, then we have an increasing flux through our loop. And Lenz's law says that B induced will be in a direction that opposes that change in flux. So if the flux is increasing, then B induced will tend to cause that uh, flux to try to decrease again, try to decrease that flux to maintain what was there. And so this B induced is the induced magnetic field due to the induced current. So if I wanna know the current direction then we would put our thumb of our right hand in the direction of B induced and then curl our fingers and they curl in the counterclockwise direction. And so that means we have an induced current that goes counterclockwise around our loop. Um, and so the question is, what exerts a force on the charges in the wire to produce 
the current I induced. Right, so these currents aren't just going to move spontaneously. Uh, there must be some force that causes them to move. Um, so one possibility is that if we had our magnetic force on a charge was given by QV cross B, but this requires Q to move relative to the magnetic field. But in the situation that we have, if we just have all our charges, so we have you know, these conduction electrons inside of our wire loop, and the wire loop is stationary, then it's not moving relative to the magnetic field, and that means the velocity is zero, and so there's no magnetic force QV cross B. So here, if our loop is stationary, then the velocity of our charge is equal to zero, and therefore this magnetic force is equal to zero. Uh, so it's not the interaction of the charges with the magnetic field directly. Um, the other way we can exert a force on a charge, of course, is with an electric field. So the electric force on a charge is equal to uh, Q times the electric field. And so what we do is we infer, or if you like, we postulate that a changing magnetic flux induces an electric field. And this electric field uh, pushes, if you like, or yeah, let's say pushes, charges around the loop. So back to our picture here, I induced has a counterclockwise direction and so current is uh, the motion of positive charge. So we're imagining, for example, positive charges moving counterclockwise around our loop. And so it must be then that there's this electric field that's been induced around this loop. And that electric field is what's pushing the current along this induced current. And so there's all our electric field lines. Um, okay. The other thing that we'll speculate about is that this induced electric field is present whether or not the loop of wire is in place. Okay, so then what we're imagining is that if we have a magnetic flux in some region of space and no circuits, no loops of wire, and we say take our magnetic field strength and we say decrease, uh, I think increase it is what we would want to do. If we say the magnitude of B is increasing like we did above, then what we must have is that if there was a loop of wire, we would get a current 
it would induce a magnetic field that would be coming out of the page and so there would be a counterclockwise current like as above and there would be electric fields that push those charges around our wire. And so what we're saying now is that that electric field is present even in the case that the wire isn't there. So if we had a wire in place, then we would say that, okay, we would get these electric fields that would be in this kind of circular orientation. Uh, okay, so let's explore that a little bit further and we'll come back to this picture and we'll add some things to it. Um, so let's try to do a calculation of the induced electric field. We're going to assume that we have a uniform magnetic field and that we're going to imagine that we have a magnetic field that's perpendicular to a an area vector of some imaginary loop. So this is the, let's say dA, this is the dA vector that is perpendicular to an imaginary loop. Okay, so one thing that we know is from Faraday's law is that the magnitude of the induced EMF is equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux. For a uniform magnetic field, uh, so let's say, let's go over here. So for a uniform magnetic field with B, uh, I think actually I made a mistake. I want B to be parallel to a DA vector. This should be parallel. We would calculate a magnetic flux as the integral of B dot DA. And if we said B and DA are parallel, then we get BDA because the cos of zero is one. And if we say B is uniform, then we can take it outside the integral. And so we just get B times A, where this is the loop area. And so what we might be imagining is that we have a certain loop over here that has some kind of area, A. So this loop has an area A is equal to pi r squared, where this is the radius of our imaginary loop, and dA is going to be into the page just like the magnetic field is. Okay, so the magnetic flux we said is BA, um, but if our imaginary loop has a constant area, this is a db dt, and I forgot my absolute value sign, and so if the area is pi r squared, then this is one way of calculating the induced EMF from Faraday's law for a changing magnetic flux. Okay, so let's call this equation one. So let's recall also that a change in voltage 
was given by this expression e dot dl uh, so around or, or along some path and so actually we probably used in the past ds rather than l so we'll go stick with ds so this is the change in voltage or electric potential between two points along some path S. So maybe we go from S1 to S2 or something like that. Okay. Um, so EMF is just a voltage. It's a voltage difference, right? A battery supplies a voltage difference between those two terminals, and we call that the EMF. And so therefore, what we could do is we could say, let's calculate this EMF for a path that starts over here, goes around our loop and returns to its starting point. And so we're gonna choose this circle to be our path S when we do the integral along path S of B dot DS. Okay. But well, we've already argued previously that E is going to be something that is going to be circular and we've picked a circular path so E dot DS is their parallel vectors everywhere on the path and so therefore we get minus the integral of S E DS okay If we really did have a loop of wire, then we would say the current is going to be everywhere the same in the wire. And so that must imply that the electric field, which is pushing the current along, must be everywhere the same along that path. So now we have just the integral of ds, but our path is a circular loop. And so it has a total length equal to the circumference of the path. And so therefore, what we get is, let's take just the magnitude of this EMF, so we'll forget about the minus sign, is just two pi r times e. And so we'll call this equation two. And what we've got now are two expressions. One of them is equation one, pi r squared db dt, and the other is equation two, two pi r e for this EMF. So one must be equal to two, they're calculating the same quantities. And so what we have therefore is that pi r squared db dt must be equal to two pi r times e. Uh, so let's see, the pi's cancel, we can cancel one factor of r, and if we then calculate the electric field magnitude, all we have to do is divide by 2, is we get r over 2 dB dt. So this is the electric field due to a changing flux or a changing, I guess we said the, it is a changing flux, but in this case we were changing the magnetic field strength to change the flux. The electric field due to a changing magnetic field um, 
for B uniform and B perpendicular to a DA vector for our imaginary loop. The, the main result here is, the big result is that um, a changing magnetic field is another source of electric fields. The other source of electric field is just a charge, right? If I have a point charge, we could calculate the electric field uh, as being proportional to Q over R squared. All right, so let's just go back to our picture here and notice Another interesting thing is that the magnitude of the induced electric field, E, is proportional to R. So the further we move out from our, the center of our circle, the stronger the electric field gets. So these vectors get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then if we go closer to our radial point, then our electric field strength gets weaker. Okay, good. So this is where I wanted to get to. So this is the end, the end of examable material for Phys 121. All right. Um, I do, I, I will write a few other things just for anyone who's interested. Um, I mean, it's actually, it's a pretty, pretty interesting result that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. Uh, so this is really getting kind of into the the beauty of the link between electricity and magnetism. You could imagine when these effects were first discovered, uh, it wouldn't be obvious that one is so intimately related to the other. But nevertheless, uh, Faraday's law tells us that they are linked in this kind of very uh, tight way. If you were to study um, physics at, or let's say electricity and magnetism at a higher level, a more advanced course. Um, so at UBC Okanagan, our upper year E&M courses are Phys 301 and Phys 401. So these are the more advanced electricity and magnetism courses. So if you were to take a course like that, what you would encounter are Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism. Um, we, we actually know a few of them. We know lots of them. We know that uh, there was Gauss's law. So if we were to evaluate E dot dA over a closed surface, Gauss's law says that that's equal to Q in over epsilon naught. So this was Gauss's law. Um, Something that we just encountered is that the integral of E dot ds around a closed loop is equal to minus, uh, well, I'll, talk, I'll discuss the minus sign in just a second, db dt. Um, so we, we were calculating just the magnitudes of this E dot ds around a closed loop. Remember this E dot ds was the calculation of the EMF 
and the magnitude or the absolute value of the EMF was equal to the change in magnetic flux with time. This negative sign just means that the induced EMF opposes the change in magnetic flux. Okay, and so this is Faraday's law. There's actually four Maxwell's equations. Um, and so it's, it's actually not too hard to guess what one of the other ones is going to be. Here what we have is a surface integral. Surface integral of the electric field. And then we have, oh, sorry. So integral of the electric field. And here we have a line integral of the electric field. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a surface integral for the magnetic field and a line integral for the magnetic field. So let's consider the magnetic flux, right? We've, we've been doing magnetic flux calculations, but we've been doing them through these uh, open surfaces, like just a, like a rectangular surface or something. If we did a closed surface, like a two-dimensional spherical surface, um, then what we could try to do is we could, I don't know how to get rid of this. There we go, closed surface. Um, Let's take a bar magnet, north-south, and let's put it next to a spherical surface. So let's imagine this is a spherical surface. Right, I, I'm not gonna draw a spherical surface, I'll draw it as a circle, but let's imagine it's 3D. Then we draw magnetic field lines. Magnetic field lines, what do they do? They exit one pole of our magnet, they exit the north pole and then they re-enter at the south pole. And so the magnetic fields of our bar magnet look something like this. And so what we can see is that we have, through our spherical surfaces, two field lines that enter the surface. So these two field lines enter the surface. And over here, we have two field lines. They're the same lines that exit the surface. And so what we would say is that in this case, the magnetic flux for our closed surface is zero. Okay, so we could imagine another scenario. What if we take our bar magnet north-south? And so I'll draw the field lines first. So here's our field lines. And then what we do is we take our, let's imagine that I, this was a little more symmetric, okay. Then we take our closed surface, which is a sphere, and we and contain our bar magnet inside of that closed surface. And what we would say is, actually, if I were to make this look a little more like the other picture. So this is our closed surface. So spherical surface. Here we have magnetic flux that exits our surface. And over here we have them entering our surface. And if you count how many lines exit and how many lines exit, uh, enter, sorry, exit and enter, they'll be equal. And you would say the net magnetic flux through our closed spherical surface is zero. And so the result is that because um, 
magnetic field lines form closed loops, we will always have we'll always have the magnetic flux through a closed surface equal to zero. So phi b is equal to zero for a closed surface. The reason that we could have a net electric flux through a closed surface is because we could have isolated charges, just a positive or just a negative. Um, and then those field lines don't have to loop around. They just, if it's a positive charge, they just flow radially outward forever. For magnetism, we don't have isolated north and south poles. They always come in pairs. And so we get these closed loop magnetic field lines and the flux will always be zero. You might try to be clever. You might say, well, what if we had the following? What if we had a bar magnet north and south? And what we're going to do is we're going to take our closed surface and I'm going to contain just the North Pole. Okay, so let's see what happens if we draw some of the magnetic field lines. Uh, so we're going to have magnetic field lines that do this kind of thing. And then we'll have this one over here and then this one over here. And so what you might say is, look, I've, I've done it. What we've got are all of these field lines that are exiting our surface. These are exiting field lines. There's a four of them, the way that I've drawn it. However, what happens is that the field lines form closed loops through the bar magnet. And so we have all of these magnetic field lines going up through the bar magnet. And these are field lines that are entering. And so we still have the situation that phi b is equal to zero. So the conclusion is then that this B dot DA, the magnetic flux through a closed surface is always equal to zero. And that's another one of the Maxwell equations. So let's write these Maxwell equations again. Maxwell's equations. So we had Gauss's law. was E dot DA is equal to Q in over epsilon naught. And then we had Faraday's law, which was E dot DS was equal to minus uh, D phi B DT. And so this was around, this, this line integral was around a closed loop. And so this was Gauss's law. This is Faraday's law. And now we have a B dot DA is equal to zero. And this is for a closed surface. This one, as far as I know, doesn't have a name, but here's one, two, three of Maxwell's equations. The fourth one is B dot DS, the line integral of the magnetic field around a closed loop. Remember that was our Ampere's law. And so this we called I through is the notation that we were using. And so this one is Ampere's law. And so that's, that looks like four equations of electromagnetism. Um, 
there's just one little modification. Maxwell realized that a changing magnetic field via Faraday's law produced an electric field. And so what he speculated is that it must have, he he's postulated that it would also be the case that a changing electric field would be a source of magnetic fields. And so he added a term to Ampere's law and it was a term that involved the changing electric field. So this is the electric flux and if we take the time derivative of that electric flux we'll, that will be another source of magnetic field. Okay and so I'm not going to talk about this in great detail but this is the added term to Ampere's law. And this term is really suggesting that a changing electric field is a source. Changing electric field is a source of magnetic field just like a changing magnetic field is a source of electric field. Okay, and so that's something that you would see if you, these are the four Maxwell equations, and this is what you would see if you took a more advanced course in electromagnetism. These are integral forms. Uh, often the Maxwell equations are written as differential equations. Uh, nevertheless, they have the same implications. Okay, and so a big part of a course like, uh, say, Phys 301 or Phys 401 would be trying to solve Maxwell's equations in different scenarios. Okay, and so with that, I'll end here, and um, there'll be just one more video for Physics 121, but again, it's just going to be additional material for for people that are interested it's not going to be something a topic that's covered on the exam what that uh, next video will discuss is kind of the analog to capacitors for magnetic fields so a capacitor could be used to create a uniform electric field and it could store electrical energy and we calculated how much energy in the electric field is stored in a capacitor. Um, we already have seen how we would create a uniform magnetic field. We use a solenoid, a coil of wire. And so we're gonna try to figure out uh, some of the properties of a solenoid and then see if we could calculate for a given current in a solenoid, how much energy is stored in the magnetic field. Okay, great, thanks very much and We'll see you next time.